Greetings, my name is Ian Yarwood. I'm a lawyer in Perth, Western Australia. In this video, I'll be discussing why I say the DNA evidence in the double murder case based on Kotao was completely unreliable and why the convictions against the two Burmese men, Wai Pyo and Zor Lin, should be overturned on appeal. The appeal papers are supposed to be filed by the 21st of July 2017. Today is the 18th of July 2017, so it's an appropriate time to go back and revisit this. My presentation today is based largely on a paper that I wrote, or a short article that I wrote, that was published on the 1st of December 2016 in the online news service, The Samui Times. Okay, I'll commence. From the time the Royal Thai Police started their investigation into the murders of two British backpackers on the Thai island of Koh Tao on the 15th of September 2014, their methods were under constant and severe international criticism and for good reason. The two backpackers who were murdered, of course, were David Miller and Hannah Witheridge. On Christmas Eve 2015, the criticisms and protests intensified when the Koh Samui Provincial Court found two small Burmese migrant workers guilty of the rape of Hannah Witheridge and guilty of her murder and the murder of David Miller. The two men, Zorlin and Wai Pyo, who were apparently of good character and who had no previous criminal records, were sentenced to death. Many observers regarded the men as scapegoats and even as the two most famous scapegoats on earth. The prosecution case against the defendants appeared to be accusation driven rather than evidence based. Cowside English, which is a Thai based English news service, reported on the judgment in a story with the headline Koh Tao Murders. Court says DNA trumps other flaws in the case. Now, without the DNA evidence in the form of a table provided by the police laboratory that supposedly matched a mixed DNA sample allegedly obtained from Hannah's body to the DNA of the defendants, there would have been no conviction. However, that DNA evidence or that trump card has all the hallmarks of being fake. This is a wonderful cartoon from a well-known cartoonist in Thailand by the name of Steph. And this highlights perhaps one of the most important aspects of the failure of the DNA evidence. The Thai police claimed that they had no uh, mixed, sample, mixed, DNA, mixed semen samples to provide to the defence. So, in other words, the defence was unable to get some original material to test to verify that what the police were alleging was true. So the police are essentially reversing the burden of proof. The police were really saying that, look, our police lab conducted some tests. The people who conducted the tests had white coats on and therefore just trust what we say. Now, unfortunately, that just doesn't cut the mustard in most courts. However, unfortunately, and with the utmost respect to the Samui Provincial Court, the judges there did accept some rather dubious evidence. Of course, it must be always kept in mind that the burden of proof in criminal trials lies with the prosecution, which is an inconvenient concept that often appears to be dispensed with in the Thai justice system. The burden was on the prosecution to show that its DNA evidence was reliable. The burden was never on the defence to prove that the DNA evidence was fake. There are four aspects of the nature of this fake evidence that I discussed in the paper that I referred to. In this video, I'll just discuss three of them because of constraints of time, but I will give you a link so that at your leisure, you may uh, read the article and uh, read the entire article. 
Now firstly, of those four, it appears that the Samui court was misled by the, about the true status of the accreditation of the police laboratory. In the judgment, and I refer to page 38 of that judgment, it states that the defendant's witness, Dr. Warawi uh, Weirwood, this is what he looks like, there's the court, The Dr. Warawi Weirwut testified that his laboratory and the police laboratory are both accredited under ISO 17025. That statement was made in the present tense. That statement makes no reference as to whether the police laboratory was accredited for the scope of the relevant testing at the time the testing was conducted. I have made an extensive effort since January 2016 to get some definitive answers regarding the DNA evidence and the accreditation of the police laboratory. The accreditation body that gave accreditation to the police laboratory is known as the Bureau of Laboratory Quality Standards or BLQS. This is a picture of its director. On the 13th of January 2016, I wrote to Director Kun Suton Vong Shari, but only received a reply some 132 days later, and only after Mr. Michael Fraser, who is the Secretary of the Asia Pacific Laboratory Accreditation Corporation, or APLAC, intervened on my behalf. The BLQS is one of three Thai accreditation bodies with mutual recognition arrangements with APLAC. In response to my emails, I've been advised by Kun Saton in writing that the police laboratory did not get the relevant accreditation until the 29th of January 2015, or four months after the testing in the Koh Tao case. As recently as the 21st of November 2016, Mr. Fraser of APLAC has confirmed in writing that this is the case. Quote, because the test facility was not accredited for the test conducted at the time of testing the specimens by BLQS, APLAC has no further role in this matter." End quote. So, according to both BLQS and APLAC, the police laboratory lacked the ISO 17025 accreditation to perform the DNA tests at the relevant time. And that is really important. That is really important. And if that is true, then it would certainly appear that the court was misled, even if the witness did not expressly lie, but merely answered the questions put to him. However, if the BLQS advice is correct, then the police and prosecutor must have known this and should certainly not have said or done anything to mislead the court. It seems from the judgment that an important reason the court accepted the police DNA evidence is that the court was under the apparently false belief that the Thai police laboratory had internationally recognized accreditation. Had the court not been misled, then it would have been in a better position to reject the police DNA evidence. Naturally, the standard of the testing in this case is more important than the issue of whether or not the police laboratory had the appropriate accreditation. However, it seems clear that in accepting, apparently incorrectly, that the appropriate accreditation was in place, the court was led to believe that the testing was of a high standard when in fact it was not. If the BLQS advice is correct, then it would be relevant to the appeal process in the Koh Tao case and possibly to the grounds of seeking a retrial. Now secondly, of those four matters I referred to before, secondly, Dr. Warawi is reported in the same paragraph of the judgment, that's the Thai page 38, as saying that both his laboratory and the police laboratory operate in keeping with international standards. One trial observer told me that this is not precisely what Dr. Warawi said. The observer said that when questioned, Dr. Warawi testified that he did not know whether the police laboratory operated in keeping with international standards 
in the Koh Tao case, but that generally it did operate in keeping with international standards. It is a vital distinction. Now thirdly, of those four matters I was wanting to discuss in the article, thirdly, Jane Twarpen, who was the Australian DNA expert who flew to Koh Samui at Andy Hall's invitation, immediately noted when she saw the DNA table that it did not have a stamp or endorsement to indicate that the police laboratory was accredited by an accreditation body such as BLQS. That's Mr. Fraser on the far right. That's the Aplac logo. And the lady on the far right in this picture is Jane Twarpen. She actually flew to Koh Samui pro bono, but she was never called to give evidence. I've had a number of telephone conversations with her and she's made it quite clear to me that the table that the Thai police produced was really of no value at all. It didn't explain anything. And she has attended trials and given expert evidence, not just in Australia, but also in the United Kingdom. And she's very highly regarded. The gentleman on the left there is uh, Jonathan Head, who's a reporter with the BBC. And he wrote a very good article uh, immediately after the judgment was handed down. And I'll endeavour to provide a link at the bottom of this video. And in the middle there is Andy Hall, who is a human rights activist. Ms. Torpen has told me that she has never attended a trial anywhere in the world where a prosecutor attempted to have such an unendorsed report entered into evidence. I've discussed the significance of this unendorsed report with Ms. Jennifer Evans. Now, Ms. Evans is the secretary of the International Laboratory Accreditation Corporation otherwise known as ILAC, and she's also the quality manager of APLAC. Ms. Evans advised that such an unendorsed report might have been produced by a laboratory that lacked accreditation or by an accredited laboratory which might or might not have produced the unendorsed report under the auspices of ISO 17025. Nevertheless, if the police and prosecutor had been serious about securing a sound conviction and had the police laboratory held the appropriate accreditation at the material time, then one would expect that they would cover all their bases by tendering only endorsed reports. Now the fourth matter that I discussed in the article, I won't have time to discuss in this video, but I do invite you to click on one of the links below so that you can uh, peruse the entire article. That's the Samui Provincial Court again. BLQS Director. Now this is a fairly interesting attachment to an email that I received from the Director of BLQS. It contains a number of errors and only a few minutes later, he noticed apparently, he apparently noticed the errors and sent me a new one. Obviously you can pause the video at this point and read those if you wish to. One of the things I also pointed out in the article is that not only uh, were there inconsistencies with what happened with the DNA evidence, but uh, also Lieutenant General Panya Marman made comments in the early days after the murders to the effect that two local men appeared to be implicated by CCTV evidence rather than the two Burmese men who were ultimately charged and convicted. But I'll invite you to have a read of that as well. This is a uh, book that was written and uh, by Jane Torpen, just verifying that she has a very good international reputation. And thank you very much for viewing this video. If you found it interesting, please like it, please share it, and please access the links below. Thank you very much.